This past weekend, Iran launched a retaliatory strike against Israel using over 300 missiles and drones. Today, to discuss this attack and why it was so ineffective is Eric Lin, a national security expert with degrees in international relations and law. Now, he has worked in Congress as senior advisor to three secretaries of defense and helped shape candidate President Barack Obama's national security platform. His focus included working on the Obama administration's Middle East peace mission. Eric championed the Iron Dome counter-rocket system, which has been credited with helping the Israeli-Hamas ceasefire in 2014. Eric, Dr. Phil here. Welcome. Thank you for having me, Dr. Phil. Well, thank you so much. I'm so fascinated to talk to you at many different levels. I have been following and actually commenting on this um, Israeli-Hamas situation since October 7th, actually, and have been very critical of what's been going on recently with um, media and uh, world leaders as well, kind of bailing on Israel and being, I think, kind of weak-kneed about their position in protecting themselves against Hamas, who's still holding hostages. And I've been very critical of what's happening at some of our American universities as well. So I um, was not surprised to see Iran do what they did, but I was very pleased to see how ineffective it was. And I know you've got some history with this Iron Dome that I'm interested in talking about. Were you surprised to see the attack from Iran? Uh, no, I was not surprised to see an attack from Iran. And uh, let, let me uh, pause before I get into uh, some more of the details on what happened on Saturday, just to to tell you that uh, I was honored to to serve as the senior advisor to multiple secretaries of defense uh, at the Pentagon, uh, served both Bob Gates and, and Leon Panetta, uh, the opportunity to, to work for a, a one Secretary of Defense who was uh, originally appointed by a Republican and another Secretary of Defense uh, appointed uh, by a Democrat. And what we knew at the Pentagon uh, and continue to know today is that uh, our security for our nation, the United States, as well as for our ally Israel, uh, it goes above politics uh, on the military level. And I appreciated that when I worked for Secretary Gates as well as for Secretary Panetta and uh, working on the U.S.-Israel defense relationship, uh, including the training jointly uh, against uh, ballistic missile uh, attacks like we saw on Saturday was something that I was honored to do for, for six years. Uh, so in answer directly to your question, uh, was I surprised uh, by an Iranian attack on Saturday? No, uh, but I think many were surprised uh, by the breadth uh, of the attack. And uh, we can go through some of the numbers uh, if you would like to. Uh, but let me just say from the outset uh, that I was most pleased with our joint efforts, the United States and Israel together, having the successful ability to counter those ballistic and cruise missiles that were being fired uh, from Iran uh, at Israeli civilians uh, and Israeli towns uh, because of all of the training that we have done together and all of the technology uh, that the United States and Israel uh, works on uh, together, uh, both in the past when I served at the Pentagon and continues to do so now. I'm glad to hear you say that because when we get to military and it goes above politics, it makes me feel like we're, at least for that part of the time, focused on being Americans instead of Republicans and Democrats. And we need to remember we are all Americans. Uh, I agree wholeheartedly. Uh, if it's okay with you, I just I just want to share some of the, the training uh, that the United States and Israel does together to counter the rocket attacks, uh, similar uh, to the one that took place on Saturday. I wish you would. As, as we look at what the Iranians did on Saturday, and, and we can talk about the, the background uh, of uh, the, the, what I would say, the Iranian false narrative as to why they wanted to attack Israel. Um, you know, they were arguably trying to retaliate uh, for uh, two of their generals being killed uh, in Damascus. Uh, those generals were, at least by reports in, in the press, uh, working together with 
uh, Hezbollah and and Hamas uh, to attack uh, Israel. Uh, and the attack that was uh, alleged to be committed by the Israelis, they haven't taken credit for it, although it certainly looked like uh, their uh, past actions uh, similar to that. But let's talk about the actual attack on Saturday. The Iranians started the attack uh, with several hundred slow-moving drones. And uh, if we think about that in military terms, uh, that was effectively uh, a diversion. It was an attempt to get the uh, Israeli air defenses. And of course, uh, we worked very closely together with them, the United States and, and other partners, uh, to detect any sort of attack coming in uh, from Iran. And so those slow moving drones took several hours to get there. Uh, the Iranians knew or had to have known uh, that the uh, radars uh, from Israel, as well as from uh, United States military assets in the region would know they were coming. So that wasn't the point of the attack, even though they did have explosives on them. Uh, it was to uh, swarm and to uh, have a diversion that would lead the U.S. Uh, and Israeli uh, counter systems to be occupied with those slow moving drones so they could fire over 100 ballistic missiles. Uh, and the number that I saw out of uh, Israel and out of uh the spokesperson for the National Security Council, uh, my friend Admiral John Kirby, uh, the U.S. Navy, stating that there was 30 cruise missiles uh, fired as well. And um, I mentioned earlier that I wanted to talk about some of the joint training that has taken place. But going back to the year 2009, and this is all in the public sphere, you can read about it in the press, the United States military trained with our allies and the Israeli Defense Forces uh, using several layers of missile defense to uh, defend a scenario where missiles and rockets uh, were fired from the east uh, at Israel from an unknown country. Um, that training proved to be very effective on Saturday. And uh, we can go into some of the different levels uh, that were used, uh, but Israel has a multi-tiered counter rocket and counter missile system, and we've developed that uh, with the Israelis and the United States and pleased to see its effectiveness on Saturday. But of course, you and I both disappointed to see that it needed to be used. Well, of course. So people understand, talk about the different characteristics of the ballistic missiles and the cruise missiles. What were they dealing with? What is the difference between the two threats? Yeah, very, very good question. So uh, cruise missiles, uh, they uh, fly uh, almost like an aircraft uh, with uh, accurate uh, ability to target uh, and they can fly at uh, high altitudes or, or low altitudes. Um, and uh, ballistic missiles are fired up into uh, the atmosphere and then and then come down uh, with still some ability to aim, but less effective uh, and and less aim than a, than a cruise missile uh, for for your listeners just at the most basic level. And uh, the different levels or tiers, as they're called, of the counter missile and counter rocket system that Israel operates um, have to do with both the distance at which those are fired and the altitude uh, that they fly. Uh, so the lowest, uh, let's start with the top, actually. The top tier is a, is a system that was developed between the United States and Israel, which is called the Aero system. It's one that the United States and Israel have been working on for, uh, gosh, over 25, almost 30 years now. And uh, it was specifically designed uh, for this type of interception. And if you look at the uh, results from Saturday night, I uh, haven't seen a full after action report now that I'm in the private sector, but I have spoken with friends and colleagues at the Pentagon. Uh, and there were successful intercepts by the Israelis, uh, as well as uh, by the United States military. And the aero system uh, that was operated by the Israelis on Saturday night uh, was able to intercept some missiles that were uh, over 150 kilometers above the earth. Uh, that wow. is, if you think about the aero system, going back to the days of President Reagan and Star Wars, something that the United States uh, was not uh, successfully employing. Uh, we now have the ability uh, to do that, as do the Israelis uh, via the aero system. Mm -hmm. uh, the second level down, if we're uh, going to speak about it on the next tier, uh, is something that the Israelis operate called the David Sling. The David Sling uses a more uh, a system to counter mid-range rockets and those ballistic missiles that we referred to. 
Um, and the Israelis uh, effectively use that uh, as well. And then the third system is the one that uh, I was honored to, to work on most specifically when I was at the Pentagon as the lead uh, for, and that is the Iron Dome system. Uh, that is intended for short range rockets. Uh, you know, you earlier raised the uh, fight and the war with Hamas in Gaza right now. Uh, many of those rockets are fired uh, out of Gaza at Israel for many, many years, but the Iron Dome can also be used effectively against the rockets uh, that were fired uh, and the missiles that were fired out of Iran if they come uh, into the short range. So you start at the top tier with the arrow. The mid range is called the David Sling. And then the uh, closest uh, tier that's used for really smaller rockets, but can be used for larger uh, at a short range if they're not able to be hit sooner, uh, is the Iron Dome system. So overall, how effective was this? You were talking about 100 ballistic missiles and 30 cruise missiles. And then we had you said several hundred slow-moving drones. How were the drones eliminated? Well, again, I, I, I want to emphasize that that I'm now in the private sector, so I don't have the 100% accuracy uh, of what uh, was done on, on uh, Saturday, but I will give you my, my uh, assessment of it. Right. And my assessment is that uh, the drones as moving as slow as, as they were, were likely taken out by, by aircraft. Uh, meaning uh, fighter aircraft, uh, the Israelis fly uh, F-35s, which is the uh, highest technology aircraft uh, that has a stealth capability. Uh, they also fly uh, F-15s and F-16s, uh, of course, all, all sold to the Israelis uh, by the United States. And, and we uh, partner with them and, and train with their Air Force. Uh, their pilots come to the United States to train, and, and the United States Air Force uh, trains with the Israelis as well uh, in a lot of those uh, exercises that I referenced earlier. So my my guess would be that the uh, slow moving drones were taken out by by aircraft, um, and uh, you know I've seen reports that a lot of that took place uh, over the airspace uh, of the country of Jordan mm -hmm. uh, because they were slow moving and could be received. Uh, the so that's to your question about the about the drones. Um, you asked about percentage effectiveness. I have seen the press reports that it was 99% effective. And if there were 300 uh, total um, projectiles, if we're going to include drones and missiles together fired at Israel, and uh, let's say it was somewhere between 98 and 99% effective, that means that somewhere between three and six did actually land uh, in, in Israeli territory or in Jordanian territory, even if they weren't aiming uh, for Jordan. Yeah. And there were no fatalities that we know of, right? Uh, that's correct. I actually just uh, saw reports this morning that there was uh, one injury to a young a young girl, uh, an Israeli girl who lived in the Negev. Um, luckily for her, I shouldn't say luckily, but uh, on the positive side for her, she was not hit with a direct hit of a missile, which uh, likely, uh, unfortunately, anyone who was underneath the direct hit of a missile would not survive. Uh, she was hit with shrapnel uh, from one of the uh, large missiles that was intercepted. And unfortunately, when you intercept a missile, uh, there are still large metal pieces and, and fragments that have to fall to the, to the earth. And so it sounds like she was hit with that. But if uh, you, you think of things all together, 300 projectiles and over 130 missiles fired at Israel, if uh, there is only one injury, then that is a, a, a pretty positive uh, outcome uh, yeah. in shooting down those missiles. So when these F-35s and F-15s and 16s took out the drones, were they doing that one at a time? Were they doing it with machine gun fire from the fighters? Or how were they taking those out? Because that's several hundred of those things. So that's like bird hunting. <laughs> yeah, my, my guess is uh, they were probably using bird shot uh, rather than buckshot. Yeah. But uh, I, I think that the U.S. also placed... Uh, aircraft carriers in the region, uh, which means that uh, we were likely flying uh, our aircraft, uh, the F-18s that fly off of uh, naval aircraft carriers, as well as U.S. Uh, F-35s and F-15s that that fly out of our air bases uh, in the Arabian Peninsula uh, would have uh, been there to help on those as well. Uh, when you ask about one at a time, you know, I, I, I don't uh, know the exact method that, that they use, but uh, when those drones were slow moving, uh, they were really not much of a match for any aircraft, whether it was a, a 15, a 16, a, a U.S. F-18 off of a naval aircraft or 
or a Israeli F-35 or a US F-35. I mean, they're, they're used to fighting other fast moving aircraft uh, in a in a dogfight, not a slow moving drone, which is why I, I said what I said at the beginning, just my analysis from, from reading the press was the drones were sent as a diversion, yeah. thinking that that was gonna be the only attack and then the missiles uh, came right afterwards, uh, uh, attempting to actually hit uh, civilians in, in Israel. Yeah, and how big are those drones? Well. Uh, I don't know the exact size of the drones the uh, Iranians used, but they they could be, uh, you know, U.S. drone size uh, is the size of a, a small airplane. But then we also have very small uh, drones that are used for surveillance uh, and and other non-lethal drones that it can be quite small that only have, let's say, uh, three to five feet uh, wingspan. Uh, so the Iranians could have used both of those. I haven't seen reports which ones they did, yeah. but the fact that they were slow moving, my guess is they used uh, their less expensive option uh, because they were on a kamikaze mission. None of them were intended to return back to Iran. Right, right. Now, is this an embarrassment to Iran? I mean, when they, I mean, they launch 130 missiles, hundreds of drones. Is this an embarrassment to them to fail so badly, or was this um, a gesture? Maybe that's not the right way to phrase that, but did they not want to inflict severe damage on Israel? Was this a kind of a desperate gesture, or was this just a terrible failure on their part? Well, I would, I would put it, I would put it this way: my sense in their goals. Uh, in attacking Israel was one to uh, in, inflict uh, pain on, on Israel uh, and two to continue to exacerbate the what their perception is the isolation of Israel and in both of those goals they have failed miserably number one uh, as we discussed earlier there was one injury in Israel and nobody killed which we're thankful for number two Instead of further isolating Israel, which, you know, we can have a discussion after this. I don't believe Israel is isolated at all. The United States continues to be its strongest ally. Uh, but in their attempt of that, they have actually reversed and had a 180 degree reversal or failure of that goal. Because what we saw on Saturday evening was not just the Israelis uh, defending their territory and shooting down those missiles and drones. But working together with a coalition that we know 100% uh, was the United States. We know that it included the British and the French, and there are other partners in the Middle East that participated uh, that for reasons uh, of their own internal uh, politics do not want to take public credit for doing so, and, and we respect that. Uh, but the fact that it was a coalition defending Israel against an Iranian attack uh, says to me that one of the Iranian goals was a miserable failure. Well, that certainly seems like it to me. I do want to talk about the Iron Dome because this is something that is fascinating to me, and I've heard so much about it, but this is something that kind of sat dormant for a good while. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, so, the Iron Dome is a technology that the Israelis uh, worked on for a number of years, facing uh, the short-range rockets that that we spoke about earlier coming out of Gaza uh, and out of uh, Lebanon. And their technology was one that um, was being built, and they had sought support from the United States uh, going back as far to uh, the year 2008. And unfortunately, at that time, uh, there was a test that was taken by the United States Department of Defense at, uh, at the Pentagon uh, down at Redstone Arsenal, where we test our, our uh, missile defense systems, and uh, came back at that time that it was not as effective uh, as the United States uh, would have wanted to see it, uh, and it was uh, more expensive uh, than initially thought. So at that point, it was uh, rejected uh, by the Department of Defense uh, prior to the time when when I uh, started serving uh, at the Secretary of Defense's office. And then how did it come back online and get started again? When I first came to uh, the Secretary of Defense's office uh, at the uh, Department of Defense, there was a uh, file that was uh, 
on my desk, so to speak, my figurative desk as the uh, head of the U.S.-Israel defense relationship at that time in 2009. And uh, it had been rejected, uh, as I mentioned. And at that time, uh, Israel had taken rocket fire uh, from Gaza, hitting uh, schools in, a, in, a, uh, in an area called Sterot, uh, where uh, children had been killed and uh, families uh, had many injured. And I had seen this system as a possibility to be able to shoot down those rockets, uh, but saw that it was rejected. And uh, I began doing some more research into it and uh, met often with uh, our counterparts in the Israeli Defense Forces, uh, where they raised uh, the Iron Dome as a uh, possibility to be able to counter that as well. Uh, one particular officer who was there, as you know, every country in their embassy in Washington sends a defense attache, uh, usually a, right. a uh, officer uh, from their army or military that will work with the Pentagon based out of their embassy. And at that point in time, in 2009, the defense attache working out of the embassy of Israel uh, was a younger general by the name of Benny Gantz. I raise his name now because he went on further to both lead the Israeli defense forces as the head of those forces uh, and then to become the minister of defense of Israel. Uh, and he is now uh, serving in the Israeli Knesset and is part of the uh, what they call their war cabinet. He joined together. Uh, with the government after October 7th uh, to ensure that there would be unity uh, in the decisions uh, made by the Israeli government. But at that point, General Gantz uh, would meet with me often at the Pentagon, and we would discuss a range of issues where the United States and Israel could cooperate uh, to include those exercises I mm -hmm. referred to earlier. And he told me that the Iron Dome had been improved since the uh, first test in 2008, uh, where it was not as effective uh, previously and said that if there were to be a, an additional test, that it would prove much more effective. So at that point in time, I went forward to uh, the leaders uh, within the Pentagon to discuss that with them. And um, well, I, I know you've had many interactions with uh, with U.S. Uh, generals and, and admirals. And yes. uh, there, there are, um, let's put it this way, not a lot of uh, opportunities if, <laughs> yeah. if something has failed once to get a second chance. You don't get a lot of second bites at the apple with that gang. <laughs> <laughs> that is correct. That is correct. So uh, I had a few, uh, let's say, figurative doors slammed in my face and physical ones and uh, a few uh, naysayers that said this is never going to be effective. We tested it already and it wasn't. Uh, but I, I persevered because I uh, understood not only that uh, General Gantz put his reputation on the line by telling me that this had been improved, but also that uh, those civilians that were being fired at uh, in southern Israel uh, did not need to live their life that way. That's not what uh, either Secretary of Defense Gates at the time uh, or President Obama at the time uh, wanted to see happen. And then I, I also thought to myself uh, that if we are able to advance a technology like the Iron Dome, not only would it be able to be used to protect civilians uh, in Israel, but it would be able to be used in the future to protect uh, American troops, uh, American civilians, and, and other allies uh, around the world. And so I, I continued to push and persevere and uh, eventually convinced uh, Secretary Gates that we needed a uh, second test on the Iron Dome system. And uh, I worked together. I don't want to take uh, sole credit myself. Uh, at the time, was working very closely with uh, Under Secretary of Defense Michelle Flournoy and uh, the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense at the time, Colin Call, uh, to to make sure that we could advance that test. And uh, the good news is that that test came back successful. We went back down to Redstone Arsenal in Alabama, and uh, the uh, missile defense experts in the United States Army retested the Iron Dome system. And at this point, it came back uh, with much better results. Uh, very successful uh, on on the test. And uh, then we knew from the United States military that uh, this system would be effective and that uh, should it be able to be fielded, uh, it would help in shooting down rockets that are fired at Israel and really uh, changing uh, the entire way that the Israelis have to deal uh, with uh, attacks that are coming in and short range rocket and potentially changing the way the United States deals with short range rocket fire. Uh, at that point. 
So to the extent that you can, assuming I've never used the Iron Dome, <laughs> explain how it works. I will. We'll assume that you, uh, uh, nor, nor nor anyone who's not in uh, the Israeli or the U.S. military has, has ever used uh, the Iron Dome previously. Um, first and most important for your listeners to know, uh, although it is named the Iron Dome, uh, it is not a dome. Uh, and I have been asked that uh, many times. Uh, that uh, some folks have thought that we actually helped set up a dome over over Israeli uh, right. towns or or, or bases. Uh, the way the Iron Dome uh, works is it is it is a missile to missile intercept system. So uh, you use a, a radar system that has to be top of the line um, radar detection, and you really need to detect it uh, right after that rocket or missile is fired, and then it uses a, a very sophisticated. Uh, computer and algorithm to calculate uh, the trajectory of that missile. Uh, and uh, obviously, uh, anyone who's taken uh, physics, even at a high school level, recognize that that's a very difficult calculation to make, uh, given the speed right. uh, of the rocket and the unknowns uh, of the atmosphere, wind or, or storms or, or otherwise. Uh, and then the way the Iron Dome uh, works is that it, it fires its own rocket or interceptor missile, as, as it's called, uh, to hit that first rocket in the air. And uh, I would describe it as best I can in, in layman's terms as trying to shoot a bullet with another bullet in the air. Uh, it is something that is uh, an unbelievable achievement of physics and science and, and uh, computer algorithm calculations to be able to do something like that. Uh, when missiles uh, and rockets are moving uh, at the speed that they are with the other. That's trajectory. amazing to me. Because you described it the way I was envisioning, like this is a bullet trying to hit another bullet. You know, I, I played tennis every day of my life, and I think two times in 30 years, we've had a tennis ball hit another tennis ball in the air <laughs> over the net. I mean, what are the chances? Like twice in 30 years. And you guys had like a 99% hit rate, uh, something traveling at God knows what speed up in the atmosphere. So uh, the precision of this is staggering. It is truly impressive. Uh, I'm a tennis player myself, and I have, have not thought about it from that concept other than to say uh, this uh, would not likely be able to be done um, by even the uh, sharpest uh, of the human sharpshooters. This is definitely something done by technology uh, and the ability to calculate uh, using the radar uh, and the algorithm of, of trajectory of, of the missile. But it is truly a, a, an amazing feat of technology uh, and science. Is it constantly adjusting in route? Uh, it does have the ability uh, to, to adjust. And, and actually, to the point I just mentioned earlier about humans versus uh, um, computerized or automated systems, the initial fire of response is made by an automated system, but but those units that work it, uh, both in the Israeli military and the U.S. military, as now the U.S. military uh, has Iron Dome systems as well. Um, it requires uh, a team that will work it, and they could change it uh, in route as well. And I just want to pause there for a second. As I mentioned, the United States acquiring uh, its own Iron Dome systems to protect our troops. Um, I will say that uh, I was very pleased to see uh, that uh, the commander in chief and the secretary of defense, Secretary Austin, made the decision uh, at the beginning of the Gaza war after October 7th that uh, the United States has now sent over our Iron Dome systems to help uh, backfill what the Israeli Iron Dome systems are doing. Wow. Uh, so they are able to to use those uh, as well, uh, which is much needed because, you know, if we were to talk about what one of uh, the potential uh, sense of how the Iron Dome uh, would not be effective. And the answer is, uh, if you don't have enough to defend all of your cities, then the city that doesn't have one uh, clearly doesn't get the benefit of it. And that's why the United States sending uh, our Iron Dome systems to help the Israelis was so important. Yeah. So they launched 100 ballistic missiles and 30 cruise missiles. The Iron Dome, is that for anything that gets through the aero system and the David Sling system? Is that when the Iron Dome kicks in? Uh in that scenario, yes. If they're firing a, a, a ballistic missile, then it would see if if uh, the others would, would not be able to hit it. The, the truth is, the Iron Dome system was developed to be a short-range 
counter rocket system, meaning intended for not ballistic missiles, but really for the short range rockets fired out of Gaza or out of Hezbollah, or of course, those that were fired at our troops uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan. It's intended as a short range counter rocket system. But if the other larger systems that really are intended for the higher tier, right? The arrow is shooting above the atmosphere mm -hmm. and David Sling is shooting those ballistic missiles uh, that are in the middle. Uh, the Iron Dome uh, can shoot down those uh, missiles or rockets uh, as they become closer to their target. But uh, I would tell you, I would rather see the other systems used because yeah. if it's that, much, the target is pretty close to hitting. Yeah. What's the range on the Iron Dome? Does it is it like a ten mile, twenty mile, fifty mile? Uh, so so the the range on the Iron Dome, they typically talk about it as as a seventy five kilometer range. Uh, the yeah. Israelis uh, using using the kilometers there, so it's just about uh, forty miles. Wow. Yeah, you get a little nervous when they're getting that because that's pretty fast. Yes, it is. That's that's why uh, the arrow system and the ballistic uh, missile firing system, the David Sling. Uh, is it's very similar to Iron Dome, and it does uh, similar point-to-point -point, uh, interception, uh, but it's it's used for those larger missiles, and that's why uh, it was good to see it be effective on Saturday evening. Uh, but sorry to have to see it used. Yeah, have they been using the Iron Dome system prior to this with missiles being fired out of Gaza? Yes, they have. Uh, you know, first uh, going back to as early as uh, two thousand and. 11 when we first fielded the uh, iron dome system uh unfortunately it was not like uh systems of the past that that we developed and, and did not see combat the iron dome was used uh, almost immediately after being fielded and uh its success rate has continued uh to hold up over time in shooting down those rockets that are fired uh from gaza uh you know having spent time traveling between the Pentagon and the Kiria, which is the Israeli Ministry of Defense during my time at the Pentagon. There were times when I was uh, in Israel and rockets were fired uh, at Israel from uh, Gaza and uh, the Iron Dome intercepted them uh, when when we and our team from the Pentagon were there. That had to be a good feeling. Bad feeling that happened, but a good feeling that you knew you had that system there. Uh, that's that's true. That's true. And I, I've, I've said this in the past. Uh, and, and I mean this, that um, working on the Iron Dome uh, and the other counter-rocket and counter-missile defensive systems uh, really is something that I'm uh, very proud to have been a part of in my career because uh, you, know, you spend a lot of time working on technologies and working on policy uh, in the Secretary of Defense's office, but it is uh, not that often that you get to see things that you worked on with your colleagues uh, actually save lives. Uh, on the ground. And so I was extremely proud of the opportunity to work uh, with the team on that. Boy, I can just imagine. How about some of these other other countries? Does anyone else, any of our adversaries, have anything that approaches the three-tiered system, defense system, like you've described with the Arrow and David Sling and Iron Dome? Are we up against anything of that sophistication with any of our adversaries? I would say the Iron Dome is certainly uh, one of the most sophisticated technologies uh, and arguably one of the best. Uh, and that would also include the Arrow uh, and the David Sling system that the United States and Israel work on together. Uh, there are some uh, systems uh, that some of our adversaries have uh, to include the Russians, but uh, I'd rather not go into uh, right. the type of system that they have. But I would just say that uh, ours are likely uh, more effective with better technology. Uh, than than those. That's good to know. What is likely to be the Israeli response to the Iranian attack? Good question. So, first, I would say uh, a question I've received since Saturday many times is: Do I believe the Israelis uh, should respond or retaliate to the attack? And uh, what I would say to you is. Looking at this from an Israeli security perspective, this is the first time that Iran has fired its weapons of any sort directly from its territory to Israeli territory. There have been exchanges over the years. Specifically, the Iranians have used their proxies to kill Israelis, both using Hezbollah and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad in Gaza. And we know, of course, their support uh, for Hamas 
uh, despite the differences between uh, Shias and Sunnis. And this is the first time that Iran has actually attacked Israel itself. And looking at a region like the Middle East, uh, knowing it as I do, I think that the Israelis are going to feel the need to have some response or retaliation. For if they don't, it will invite another attack in the future. Now, you asked what will that attack or response be? My sense is that the Israelis understand that we're not looking to start World War III. We are not looking to have a full-scale war with the Iranians. Certainly, the United States works very closely with Israel, as it did on Saturday, to shoot down those rockets and those missiles. But we're not looking to escalate into a war at this time. So what the Israelis need to calculate is what type of response do they feel is necessary, would be effective at getting the message across that Iran should never, ever try anything like this again, shooting directly at Israeli civilians. But short of starting a response and a tit-for-tat attack that could lead to war with Iran. I always talk about the psychological aspects of this and the psychosocial aspects. You can think about personalities involved. And when I think about cities and countries, I think about the collective personality. And I do believe we teach people how to treat us. I think we teach them how to treat us individually, whether you're talking about somebody on an elevator or cutting in front of you in line at, at a movie or a relationship you're in. And I think the same thing is true on the international stage, these countries are run by people and people have personalities. And I think we do teach people how to treat us. You said it for me. If you, if you have somebody lob 130 missiles at you and hundreds of armed drones, and they're not very good at it, so it doesn't inflict much damage. And so you go, well, no. Well, you know, no harm, no foul. You just say, well, <laughs> I'm not going to respond to that. You're just asking them to try harder, you know, try better. There's no consequence for it. And I think you can't reward bad behavior. And that's bad behavior <laughs> when you send missiles at Israeli citizens. If there's no consequence to it, you're rewarding bad behavior. If that happens, you're inviting it to happen again. So there has to be some response to it where, like you say, they've got to say, that was not worth it. A, we're apparently not very good at it. And B, that was really painful. We did that and didn't get anything out of it. And the response was very painful, whether it's blowing up their oil fields or you know, whatever inflicts the most pain. but. <laughs> I agree with you. you. You certainly don't want to start World War III, but we didn't start this. I mean, they started this, but something has to be done. And if you don't, you're just inviting, you know, psychologically, you're endorsing it and inviting it to occur again. Am I wrong about that? I would agree with you. Uh, the Israelis need to respond so they can ensure that this does not ever happen again. They have to reset the level of deterrence, where the Iranians thought that this was not going to be something that would lead to a war. However, they also thought that because of what's taking place in Gaza, that Israel may not respond. And that was a miscalculation on their part. But while I use the word miscalculation, let me talk further about some of the concerns about what could happen. Right? Most of the wars in world history were started by miscalculations. Right. And so what we need to be careful of, and certainly what I advise my my colleagues uh, in the Israeli Defense Forces to be careful of, is that there is not a miscalculation that could be uh, causing a future war. So let's talk about a couple scenarios. First, I would say what the United States does well, and the Israelis did this uh, in, in their previous uh, experiences also, is to take a beat or take a breath. 
there is no reason to rush into a response today or tomorrow because Israel knows it has superior capabilities to the Iranians. Just on the most basic sense of military, the Iranians used missiles and drones because their air force has a technology level of flying F-14s from the 1980s like you saw in the first Top Gun movie, not right. the second. Israel clearly flies the most sophisticated technology and aircraft and has the ability to do different things, as does the United States. So take a beat, take a minute before making a decision about what to do. Second, any response should be seen as one that is trying to reset that deterrence from the Iranians, but should not try to invite an additional response or retaliation from that. So this is where the term miscalculation comes into effect. As we go up this escalation ladder and Israel responds, as they need to, to sit, reset the deterrence like we spoke about a minute ago, they should be extra diligent in ensuring that the loss of life does not exceed large numbers. Now, I want to be careful in saying any loss of life is horrible. Of course. But sadly, in war, people lose their lives. And Israel, if they respond by hitting an Iranian military base where those missiles were fired from, or they respond by hitting some other Iranian military target, they should do so without trying to kill a large number of people. Because, let's think about it in two scenarios. One, they hit an Iranian military target and there's one or two guards there. Those one or two guards, obviously, uh, you know, they have lost their lives and that is that is a, a casualty of war. But if for some reason there happens to be 30 or 40 people that are there and they get killed when the Israelis respond and the Iranians are going to feel the need for them to respond as well, that would have been a miscalculation by the Israelis. We know that second to the United States, Israel has some of the best intelligence capabilities and reconnaissance capabilities of any nation around the world. We want to ensure that they are using those capabilities, that when they retaliate and when they respond, that they do so in a way that they are not escalating this with a potential for miscalculation. So response is necessary, but what I would call is intelligence response, protecting against miscalculation. Right. From where you sit, the Iranians had to think three or four plays ahead in this and know whatever they did, however successful it had to be, it was, they had to predict that Israel is going to respond. They can't think we're going to send over 130 missiles and several hundred drones against Israeli civilians, and whatever the success rate is, they're just going to go, well, wish you hadn't done that. They're going to know Israel is going to respond. What do you think they predict Israel is going to do? So I, I try to stay out of the business of predicting what's in uh, the mind of the Ayatollah. Uh, you know, in international relations that I spent years studying, you talk about rational actors and irrational actors. I do think that the Ayatollah is rational. However, I think he is willing to use rational, excuse me, irrational means to get to rational ends. And what I mean by that is, well, he's not completely irrational, something that would concern us even further, and we can talk about that uh, in, in, in uh, a future conversation. I do believe that the Iranians understood that the Israelis would retaliate. And I will say to you that while they knew, the Iranians knew the capabilities of the Israeli counter-rocket and counter-missile system, I think they thought a lot more of their 130 missiles were going to hit their targets than actually did. Mm -hmm. So let's play that scenario out. Obviously, it would have been horrible for Israel should that have taken place. But even if 20% of those 130 missiles hit, you now have 26 missiles hitting Israeli targets, and you know that people would have been killed. And to your question earlier, Dr. Phil, they had to know there would be a response and a retaliation for 26 missiles hitting Israelis. 
Right. And so now the question becomes, what can Israel do to have an intelligence response, excuse me, intelligent response that makes sure they they make sure they set up the deterrent again without going too far for the chance of miscalculation uh, and continued escalation. Is it reasonable to consider going at some of their industrial complex in terms of hitting an oil field or something like that to cripple their economy in some way? I'm going to leave the specific targets to the Israelis to decide how they would like to do it. I, I think if uh, I'll give you my perspective, again, I'm not currently in the United States uh, government serving the Department of Defense, but my sense from looking at it, the private sector previously serving at the Department of Defense at the Pentagon, it would be our goal to hit military targets, mm -hmm. uh, specifically those military targets uh, that took part in firing 130 missiles at Israel. And therefore, if there are still people that are there and there are casualties uh, based on them serving as part of uh, their military service, then those are casualties of war. Uh, I'm not sure that I, I would be uh, personally advocating for uh, shooting at, at uh, their industrial base or oil fields because I think there are is, as we would say at the Pentagon, a target-rich environment in Iran of plenty of military targets to hit. Yeah, that's true. Are they likely, as they have done in Gaza, told people, we're going to hit here, you need to get out of there? Are they likely to try and avoid loss of life by saying, we know where these came from, and we're getting ready to hit that target? I would say that the Israelis have gone... Uh, to extraordinary lengths uh, to avoid uh, civilian casualties when they are hitting targets. Uh, and you mentioned a couple different ways in Gaza that includes uh, dropping leaflets uh, to neighborhoods, as well as using uh, something that uh, they call the knock, which, are, which is a non-explosive ordinance that can be dropped on the top of a building and when it falls like a anvil falling on top of a building, it makes a loud noise. And it is a, a warning that uh, next round will be not just a loud anvil, but an actual explosive uh, device. So there are some things that they have done uh, to take extraordinary means uh, to avoid civilian casualties. I will tell you that my concern as it relates to Iran is that um, Attacking a country as far away as Iran is from Israel is a very difficult military concept. Uh, you know, we sometimes take for granted in the United States that we can fight a war anywhere around the world, and that's mainly due to our aircraft carriers and our Navy's ability to go anywhere and to bring the war machine wherever it needs to go. Uh, you know, it, Israel is a, a smaller nation with a very strong and powerful military, but they do not employ aircraft carriers. And so those types of attacks and those types of responses, um, they take a great deal of planning and a great deal of effort. And uh, direct answer to your question is, I'm not sure they want to telegraph that because uh, they want to make sure that uh, they are successful. Yeah. Well, I hope, and I'm curious as, kind of as we conclude that I can get your thought on this. They have done a service in getting, I think, a flip for Israel in maybe flipping the script back and getting some of those that were kind of moving out of the Israel camp and leaning on them to do a ceasefire, to back off of Hamas and um, not really standing strong with, with Israel. And it seems like they've certainly solidified some of the allies behind uh, Israel again, do you think that'll last? Well, I would say that uh, Iran attacking Israel was a mistake. It was a mistake because they have now shown that they are willing to step out from behind the curtain where they've been hiding behind those proxies and firing from Lebanon, Gaza, and Yemen. And now the world knows Iran for who it is, and the Israelis see that the Iranians are willing to actually attack their own territory. 
and the Israelis will now be able to respond to reestablish that deterrence. But they have also, as you just stated, brought the world to support Israel once again in the face of Iran. And I think the Israelis understand that, and the Iranians misunderstood that, where they saw some in Europe, as well as some uh, parts of the United States, not supporting Israel in what's taking place in Gaza. And now they have reversed that by bringing both the Europeans and others in the region to stand up against Iran alongside Israel. They have done more to help Israel gain the diplomatic support that may have been somewhat decreasing than they ever planned for. And that was their true failure in their attack on Israel on Saturday. Well, as you say, miscalculation. I would love to have been a fly on the wall with um, the military commanders and the Ayatollah the next morning for the debrief to say, well, <laughs> here's, here, here's how this all came down. We did all this, we did all that, and um, we did hit a girl with some shrapnel, but she seems like she's going to be okay. Other than that, we've pissed off everybody, and they've lined back up with Israel. Other than that, I don't seem like we've achieved much. Um, I, I, I'd have loved to have been a fly on that wall. Well, you know, as, as we learned in, in uh, the U.S. military and Department of Defense, there, there is uh, not a lot of honesty in failed military operations. And what I mean by that is if we look back at Saddam Hussein's army in Iraq, his spokesman used to say that they were winning the war against the United States. And if you remember those videos behind him where, where U.S. tanks were roll, rolling into the town behind him, but he would yeah. stand on television and say that they were winning. Yeah. Um, I, I did see a report that the Iranian national press said they killed 30 Mossad agents in southern Israel at an Air Force base. And my only response to that is I have no knowledge of which base they're talking about, but why would 30 Mossad agents, which is their spy agency uh, equivalent to the CIA, be at an Air Force base in southern Israel. Uh, they wouldn't be. And also, Israel is a nation that would report if there were 30 casualties uh, to their agents. So, uh, again, not a lot of truthfulness in military uh, failure spokespeople. Yeah, well, uh, maybe they're selling that. <laughs> I, suppose, I suppose that's a possibility. Uh, so they have to sell something to their public because their, their attack on, on Saturday was, was really a failure, uh, both in the tactical military, uh, sense, as well as in the strategic political sense, as you just said. Yeah. Well, Eric, listen, I, I see by our clock on the wall that we're out of time. This has been absolutely intriguing. Thank you for taking the time to demystify so much of this for us and, give us some insight into how this works, how it went down. Thank you very much for having me. And I, I appreciate uh, the questions. I, I enjoyed the conversation and uh, happy to continue it uh, at any time in the future. Well, I certainly will take you up on that. And your wisdom and insight on this is a rare opportunity for me and my listeners on fill in the blanks. I look forward to talking to you again. And thank you for the time that you've shared with us. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Phil. Appreciate you having me. Talk soon. Thanks.